Uh, this thing is off screen though. Oh, it's the whole. Th oh yeah, that's that's true. Oops. Let's get that back. So uh, we're back from our coding dojo, and IntelliJ isn't fitting on the screen. That should probably fit, isn't fitting on your screen either. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to revert my local changes. Okay, I just want to finish off this one thing because while the code do coding dojo itself wasn't very interesting, I think we we we've learned something. So um, when I uh, okay, so we had this uh, GitHub repository that like a whole bunch of people had the ability to uh, to push to. And uh, so we had people here doing the uh, doing the dojo, and right, and there was a cycle of like, okay, I'm on deck. I get the, I, I do a pull to get all the latest changes. I make my changes. I commit and I push, and now we now we can share. Um, and so then we've had other people uh, contributing too, which is cool. And and uh, and something got busted. And the way I found out that I got busted is that my continuous integration server uh, went red, and uh, I probably got an email about it too. Um, and so, okay, now now I go and I look, and oh, this thing's uh, this thing's red. And so now I go down here to the bottom of the log, and it's saying uh, could not read the project, and so non parsable POM. Okay, so now in my local environment, I went and I got the latest changes, and I got a, an error in IntelliJ saying that there were Git conflicts. So we have multiple people that are writing to the same file, and we had two people that made um, a, a change. To the to the same file um, like on the same lines and get didn't know how to reconcile those changes um, and uh, and but things got checked in anyway apparently which okay we're learning here um, and so now when I get it um, and actually if you go look I wonder what GitHub actually shows for that let me go to the palm here so here's the palm and when I reload it okay so it looks like uh, some new code got added, and it's annotated with this like uh, bunch of greater than symbols and an equal sign, and a big equals line, and then you go all the way down here, and it's like, aha, this thing, and then a big old ugly hash. Uh, basically, uh, what, what happened is uh, someone um, probably made some local changes and then got the remote ones, and there were conflicts, and then instead of resolving the conflicts, and IntelliJ doesn't make this overly easy, uh, they said, ah, forget it, check it in, okay. Good, I'm done. But now I don't have a valid XML file, right? I've got uh, stuff that isn't nested correctly. So that's okay. This is an important part of software development, uh, and this is something that you probably don't get as a student. And so then, uh, uh, this is something that I've had to do many times in my career. This is things I've caused many times in my career. And so now you just need to go back and, and fix this stuff. This is based, this is Git saying, listen, for these lines right here, there are some changes here that conflicted with some other changes there. Uh, please fix it. And so luckily, I think it's a pretty easy fix. Um, we just go and, uh, oh yeah, you gotta add this here. Get rid of this marker here. We probably don't want bin student ID there in GitHub for the entire world to see. And get rid of this guy. And now I think you've got valid XML. Oh, I'm sorry, you know, before I did that, um, I, I should have run um, Maven. You would have seen that it's, uh, that, that it wouldn't be able to parse the palm. Now I run it and I see that, uh, okay, there's a failing test. Huh, interesting. Cool, but I want to resolve that conflict first of all, and then in another commit, um, I'll, uh, I'll go through and I'll fix that unit test. Um, so uh, resolved conflict that was inadvertent, well, that was committed uh, to GitHub. And so this is one of the benefits of continuous integration. Uh, you, you've got this, uh, you know, this what, a disinterested third party. You've got this clean room environment that goes out there, gets your code, tries to run it. And it's like, oh my gosh, there's a problem. Um, and so then, you know, you can be confident that uh, that it's, uh, you know, that that okay, yep, things are uh, things are are broken, and that's okay. So let's see here, it's running again. So build nineteen. Nice, okay, so let's go watch it run for a little while. It's got to set up the environment and everything. And, and I hope what happens is that I see the same failure that I saw on the command line with that failing test. Oh, I should stop tapping because that probably... Oh, let's see, I, I didn't mute my... Uh... 
a microphone. Did I? No, I muted my speaker and muted my microphone in the Hangout. Oh my goodness, so slow. Okay, so yep, looks like there was a failure there, and sure enough, there was a failure. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll let, I, I got other stuff to talk about tonight. If one of you guys wants to fix it while I'm droning on about Project 4, uh, feel free to do so. You can do it because you have the ability to push the repository. Anyway, um, this is a, a fact of life. As a matter of fact, whoever checked in that, uh, that, that failure, uh, thank you. This is, this is what it's like working with other software developers. Um, and so, yep, sometimes, you know, things break. Um, and, and so then, uh, I, you know, I, I guess, oh, uh, so someone mentioned a, a pull request. Um, right, that's another way, um, and, you well, know, maybe in a, in, a, in a different version of this uh, activity, we would, would use pull requests. So the whole idea is that in a pull request, I make changes on a branch or a fork of a, a repository, so not directly on master. So someone asks about, hey, can we commit directly to master? That's probably not best practice. Best practice is to say, hey, listen, I've got these changes. They're often a branch, meaning that unless someone checks out that branch, they won't be able to see it. Um, but it's often a branch, and that way you can get, uh, you can do a code review on those changes before they're merged to match master, and uh, you can also run your continuous integration uh, against the, the the pull request before it's merged to master. Um, and that would have found that, oh, okay, yep, these bunch of changes, oh, that broke some tests, okay. Um, and then you would be able to fix them, and GitHub has a nice way of visualizing all that. Anyway, mm, learning. Okay, I thought it was neat. Okay, so, um, project four. So the first three phases of the project, uh, you were working on the command line, and you had, uh, you know, basically your 1970s style program, right? It's a command line program. You start at main, you execute a bunch of code. You're using object oriented programming to go and call stuff, but it sort of starts at main and does some stuff and then it exits. Great. Uh, now, it's, it's, now it's time to move into the 90s with, uh, with, with a web service. So um, in this project, uh, you're going to augment your airline application uh, to have a client and a server. So you're actually going to have two programs talking to each other. Um, how many of you guys have done this kind of thing before? Who's taken a networking course or done some web stuff? Cool. Okay, good. A handful of people. So um, I guess I'll advise you, and this is based on my own experience as a student and then with all my students over the years, this is different. You're dealing with two things running at the same time communicating with one another. Um, Debugging is more difficult. Um, making sure that like all the, the right code is running is just another dimension. But this is what you do in the real world, right? I mean, you know, no one's running command line programs anymore. Yeah, I mean, for some things, but not, you know, not not, not a full time probably. Um, and so I, I think it's a valuable experience to learn how to have two programs, two processes communicating back and forth. So that's what we'll do here in Project Four. So. Um, I'll go into some of the, the details, I guess, about writing uh, web applications here in, as part of the, the, the demonstration. Um, uh, but but here, here's what we're going to do. Okay, so there's something called, um, and this is all covered in the, uh, in, the, in the web lecture, which that one, I think more so than maybe any of the other ones you need to watch and understand. Um, there's something called a servlet. And so a servlet is a Java object that runs inside a web server and handles requests to that web server. And so the servlet provides this REST API uh, on top of your airline. And so uh, a REST API is essentially, well, a series of URLs that have certain behaviors. So when you hit a URL that looks like, you know, that with the host and the port, slash airline, slash flights, question mark, name equals airline, that uh, if you send an HTTP GET to that, um, all the flights in the airline should be returned uh, or sent back to the, um, to the, the requester using the pretty printer. Okay, right, so you wrote your pretty printer in Project 3, you've had your airline and flights all along, now you have that stuff residing inside a web server. If you send an HTTP post to that, uh, to that URL, that's the way that you add a new flight to the, uh, to, to, to the uh, add a new flight to the airline, um, and you provide the information for the flight as parameters to the, uh, to the post. So name and flight number and, and source, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of that, uh, so it's the name of the, the airline and then all the information about the flight. Um, all of that, instead of being entered on the command line, now, well, in addition to being entered on the command line, we'll see that in a second, all of that now is, is sent to the web server um, as uh, parameters to the, uh, to the post. 
Uh, note that if the airline does not exist, a new one should be created. It's important to note that in this project, you're not going to use the, um, the, the text file functionality anymore. So this isn't exactly the best example in the world, but your, um, uh, your airline does not persist uh, beyond the lifetime of the web server. So you bring your web server up, you hit these URLs a bunch of time to create an airline, and when you bring it down, it goes away. It lives in memory. You wouldn't do that in real world, but hey, this is, you know, this, this, is, this will be enough, trust me. So there's a URL that's all about um, uh, 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 getting all the information about an airline and then um, adding flights to that airline. There's also a new URL, and this represents new functionality in your application, which queries an airline for flights that originate from uh, uh, flights for a given airline that originate at a given airport uh, and uh, uh, terminate at a, uh, a destination airport. So this is a new piece of functionality, and you can probably figure out how to implement that pretty easily. So. This project is different, right? So you've got this thing that runs over there in the web server uh, that's called the server that supports these two URLs. Uh, okay, and that's cool. You can send URLs to that. There's also uh, a plain old Java program that you use to interact with the airline, but uh, but you act with this airline remotely to the web server. So there's a Project 4 class, which is a command line client program, that sends HTTP requests to the uh, the server. And so then its command line looks pretty much like it did for projects one, two, and three. Um, it's, it's got the, uh, it's not 24 hour time, uh, all of the you know, same restrictions on the, the flight number and the airport codes, all of that good stuff. Um, except that's got some new, some different options. So uh, its options are the, the host and the port um, for, uh, for the, the server. So do you guys want to host and port are? I, I hope, right? The host is the name of the machine on the network or the internet, and then the port is the, well, the conceptual hole in the back of the machine through which you, um, right? You know, uh, that, that, that you use to communicate uh, with it. And so all of these are, um, are arguments to the, uh, or well, are sent to the, uh, the, the command line tool. Oh, okay, sorry. In addition to host and port, there's also a search um, and I'll talk about some examples down here. And then you've got your old friend print and your old friend readme. So this is a, a, a well, this is a command line tool that interacts with the uh, with the with the web server. Uh, so let's see here. So there are several functions. So here's some examples of invoking the uh, the, the project main class. Oh, and by the way, this is not the syntax that you would use. You'd use the dash jar with executable jar. I'll show you some examples in a moment. So uh, if you want to add a flight to the server, here's what you do. You invoke your project for main, you set the host, the port, uh, and you give it sort of the, the arguments that you're used to, right? The name of the airline, the, the flight number, uh, information about uh, when it leaves, and information about when and where it arrives. Um, so you do that to populate your airline, and then you can search for a flight between two uh, airports. Um, and so what this thing should do when you specify the host and the port, the dash search option, the name of the airline, and then the uh, or, or, originating airport and the terminating airport, um, it should query the, uh, the airline and pretty print the, uh, all, all of the airlines, sorry, all the flights that go between those two airports. You know, if there aren't any flights that go between the uh, two airports, as a direct flight, don't try to like put too much thought into it. Um, if there's not a direct flight between the two airports, um, then uh, it should say so. Just say, yeah, there's no, there's no flight there. So um, error handling, new, you know, new functionality, new kinds of errors they need to handle. So uh, obviously, it's the, you know, the command line is wrong, uh, so uh, all that usual stuff. If you can't connect to a server, the server, if something bad happens on the back end, it should be reported nicely to the client, stuff like that. So we're going to spend another a next, next little bit, you know, the rest of class really, uh, talking about how to work with all this stuff. But do you have any questions about the requirements, not the how, but the, the what of the uh, of the assignment? Yes. Uh, so the project four would be a different class, right? Project four is a different class. So yes. It would be the client, and project two would be the server. You probably don't need your project three anymore because the server is well. It's the server. There's no command line there. There is, but you don't invoke it. Yeah. So what do we do with project three? Um, print it out and put it in your refrigerator. You're done with project three. No, you you uh, 
uh, you can probably reuse a lot of the code from Project Three as Project Four if you've you know your command line parsing, you a lot of your input validation, all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah, and you can print it on your fridge. Yeah. Um, I have a question about logistics. If that's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, will we have like a reference um, Project Four? Oh, will you have a re yes? You will. You're, you're gonna you're gonna see it in just a moment. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna make you write this from scratch. Yeah. There is some sort of database involved? There is no database involved. So like I said, the airline is not persistent beyond the lifetime of the web server. You shut down the web server, your airline goes away. That's fine. Okay. So this is a big technological leap. It's a big tooling leap between projects three and four. And over the years, uh, you know, I, I figured, okay, what do you guys need to be successful? Um, and so project uh, four introduces, uh, there's a new Maven archetype. Uh, for this. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, walk you through creating the, the, the new project from the archetype and then working with it. Um, the good news is, is that you've got all your old friends in terms of unit tests and integration tests. You've got a different kind of integration tests now because uh, you're not testing just your command line. You can also test like the web server while it's up. It's good stuff. It's fun. I hope you enjoy it. Honestly, I do. I think it's enjoyable. Okay. So let's go back to, uh, oh, let's go back to our old friend over here. So this is my, uh, my personal uh, repository here. Um, and so, OK, I will uh, run the Maven archetype. Now it's going to blow up because I have like bracket login, but that's OK. OK, so I'm going to generate my archetype for me. And um, I'm going to call it airline web because I've already got an airline project here. Everybody see that okay? Probably not. There we go. No, oh, that's okay. Uh, so let's see here. I think this is all up to date. Okay, so it's like, hey, do you want to create something that looks like this? I do. Okay, and it did, it added it to all the good stuff. Okay, so what does that get me? Um, actually, well, wait a second. So I created the the, the project. Before I go into IntelliJ, I want to make sure it works. Um, and so I'll do a Maven. Oh, it has a. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll do a Maven clean. And uh, warning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big deal. Uh, and I'll do a Maven verify. Now. Uh, so you can see it going by, it's building stuff, it ran the unit tests, uh, it's going to uh, do a whole bunch of other stuff. Now it runs the integration tests. And the integration tests actually start up the web server and then uh, run some integration tests against the web server um, and shut it down. Everything was successful. Good. So now we'll walk through um, some of the stuff that happens there. Um, so from the Maven standpoint, it's stuff you're used to, right? Maven verify. Great. It does all the stuff. But um, Building a web application requires a bunch more things than building your command line application. Um, let me just check here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, something else. Okay. Um, I want to check my code in first because I'm funny that way. Let's see here. I'm not going to need the kata anymore. Here is that code. We're going to go and we're going to synchronize the project so we can see it. Version control, unversion files, 12 of them. All of that stuff gets added. Okay, so this is going to be added um, airline web application for project four. Push. Great. Okay. So your program has two components. There is the command line and there is the web server. The archetype creates a, a very simple application for you. It, um, it has all the pieces, parts you need, uh, but it, uh, let's see here, has all, the, has all the pieces that you need, uh, but your job is to sort of fill in the, uh, fill in the blanks. Oops, does that recognize it as a project yet? Maybe? No, it doesn't. Um, let's try again. Synchronize. Yeah, it might be thinking about it. I don't know. It doesn't recognize that as a project because airline web. 
I wanna, okay, I'm just going to reopen this guy. Important state Java. Just thinking about it. Good, found it. Get master. Okay, my line web. Um, so you've got a project four. Um, okay, and so the uh, out of the box, what the archetype gives you is a simple web application that lets you uh, manage key value pairs on on, on the web. Um, I guess that's no SQL. Anyway, um, no. Okay, uh, and so then uh, you have the following. So in order to use this application that comes out of the box, you need to start your uh, start your web server. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use two windows here so that uh, because we have two programs. Yeah. Which error? Oh, in the in here. Um, I, uh, I resolved the conflict and I checked it in. So if you're working on that, you should just be able to pull down the. I get the same error when I try to use the main uh, archetype image. Oh, you, uh, it's probably something different than. It, it's the it's the it's this thing right here. It, it can't parse the the palm. Um, that was just a bottom error. Yeah. Um, that's because there's still test cases. Sorry, okay. This output right here was from the coding dojo right. thing, yeah. But you're you're having problems running the archetype. Uh, I'll work on it. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I, well, here again, if you have problems with the archetype, let me know because that's uh, something that is pretty fundamental. But in the meantime, uh, let's do this. So there are um, yikes. There are two components uh, to the project. There is the client and the server. So we'll run the server over here in in this window. So the way you do that um, is that you use a well use a command called Maven Jetty Run. So Jetty is what's called a Java web container. It basically is a web server that's implemented in Java, and it supports something called the Servlet API. The Servlet is the code that you write to uh, implement your web application. So I started here. It started it on port eighty eighty. It's running on my local machine. So then if I go to, uh, if I just go to localhost 8080, uh, it's, it's running something. And it says Jetty telling me, oh, there's something called airline. So then uh, yeah, I can visit that. Um, and OK, well, uh, yeah, sure, I'll talk about this now. So um, one of the, uh, so to sort of help you get started and to make sure that everything works, uh, there is an index.html that's served up. This is a simple HTML page with a form. Actually, I think a student wrote this for me. Um, where you can interact with the REST API using an HTML form. So this is, uh, you know, as you're working to get, as you're working on your Java code for access and for calling the REST API, you can use this form to, to interact with it to make sure that, you know, everything is still working. Um, so for instance, if I submit this form right here to list all key value pairs, it uh, calls the, it calls this URL and it says, ah, there are zero key value pairs in there. That is true. Um, so if I want to have, uh, you know, a, a key, if I want to say, hey, what? Tell me what the uh, the value for key A is. This will call. This will invoke this URL. So flights uh, key equals A. A is mapped to null. I can create a new uh, a new pair of like A and one using this form. That will do an HTTP POST. And told me, ah, a, uh, a is mapped to one. And now when I search again for A, A is one. So what I'm doing here is I'm using this web page, very simple HTML form if you want to go learn about such things, uh, to interact with my web server. right? So I've got my web server here. I should really have it log stuff, shouldn't I? Anyway, um, I've got my web server running here. It's just sitting there you know, happily running. Uh, and I'm interacting, it, interacting with it using the, uh, that web page. Now, that's just for development and debugging purposes. The way that uh, the program, the assignment works, is that you use the command line. So uh, if I go and I run the executable jar that is built as part of this test, so airline.jar, um, 
It's telling me, okay, so I ran my main method, says, ah, oh, missing command line arguments. So I need to give it the host, localhost. It's running my local machine. The port is 8080, so it's the same stuff that you had in the URL in the web browser. Um, and then let's see here. I think if I don't give it any arguments, it'll print what's ever there. Yeah, server contains one key value pair, A1. Okay, so let's add another one, B2, map B to 2. So now if I run uh, run my command line program with no arguments, it gives me both of them. Now if I go back to my web browser and I say list all key value pairs, it shows both of them. Okay, T time out. What's going on here? W walk me through what I just did and how it worked. I've got a web server, which is a Java program running over here on the right. It's keeping track of these key value pairs, right? I'm interacting with that web server multiple ways. I'm using a web browser. When I hit that URL in the web browser, uh, what happens? Do they teach you about the web in this fancy college of yours? Do they? No? You guys? So yes, the, the the Facebook. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So and and, and 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 I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but no, I, I I don't. And this is the kind of thing like, well, I'm I'm of the age where like this is like was new when I was in college, right? This is like okay, and so then you know. We all thought we were going to be millionaires because we knew HTML and CGI. Right? Yeah, it's crazy now, but it's like that's what we thought. And so, like this was like kind of new. And you know, the way I had to, you know, the way I learned this stuff was uh, by you know playing with HTTP and things like that. So, but you know, uh, I'm guessing that most people you know have been doing this stuff since like they were in high school, um, but using it, but maybe not understanding what's happening underneath the covers. So this is all explained in the web lecture, but the whole idea is that there is this you know, standard protocol called HTTP, the Hypertext Transport Protocol. And this is what moves information around on the World Wide Web, right? So, uh, and, and it's a data protocol and it describes, it has these things called you know, various requests that you can send to it. So when you hit a URL in your web browser, what that is really doing underneath the covers is your browser takes that URL and puts together one of these HTTP requests, sends it out over the internet, which then you know routes it to the right machine. It ends up at some web server running someplace. It's one of these guys over here on the right. Takes that request, processes that request, and in the lecture you'll learn about how servlets do it and how all the you know, routing works and everything like that, and then returns a result. And so in this case, when I hit this URL, what the server returns back to me is this text right here. So I hit that URL from a web browser. I also hit that same URL from this command line program. Right? The server doesn't care what the client is. It doesn't care whether it's a web browser. The server just says, you, to you, know, you told me you wanted this thing. Right, here it is. And just sends it back. And so the fact that then you know, what the program does is it makes the HTTP call, you know, connects to the server, and then you know uh, gets the gets the response. It prints it out to the command line, the browser. It you know renders it in the browser, like that. Okay. So that's what the the the, the program that comes out of the box does. And and your job in uh, in, in project uh, four is to you know take this and then do real work with it by augmenting it to store your airline in the server and then modify uh, the, the, the command line tool to then interact with the URLs that are specified here in the assignment. Um, I guess they're kind of the same, are they the same URLs? Well, yeah, it's the same URLs, you need to implement uh, different, um, different parameters to it. And we'll see how to do that in a minute, but I want to pause here for questions. Because, because honestly, I mean, I, I don't know how familiar this is to you or if like, if there's sort of fundamental things that we can resolve now to save you some time later. Yeah. Uh, can we see the command you used to run the... Um, jetty? Uh, which command line? Uh, not the Jetty. The yeah. Apple. Yeah. So it's the Java dash jar, uh, just like you used in the first couple of projects. Right. This is a command line pro program. But instead of like writing to the file or doing the pretty printing or whatever, it's talking to the web server. Okay.
let's see how this is done. I'm going to start on the, the back end. So there's a thing called a Java servlet. A, a Java servlet is a, a class, it's an object. An object uh, this class is instantiated, and there's an object that sits there inside your web container, inside your web server, that uh, that specifies the behavior of your of your program, of your website, uh, if you will. And so the servlet API provides an abstraction over the HTTP protocol. Um, and, and really, it forms the contract between the, the web container, which is this thing called Jetty that someone else wrote, and your code, which is what you write. And so there's an API that you use. So for instance, you have a server that extends thing called HTTP servlet. And there are methods that you override, like do get. And so do get is invoked when the, uh, when the web server receives a URL request, which is a, a get request. There are various verbs in, uh, in HTTP, and one of them is called get, which is just like, Here's a URL. Give me whatever contents you have at that URL. So at the uh, at the end of the day, um, when I uh, when I, when I well when when the web web server is hit uh, when the HTTP get is done for a particular for the, for the URL for the servlet, this code is invoked. As a matter of fact, how about I just uh, I'm going to stop Jetty and I'm going to run it. Um, I'm going to run Jetty debug. Oops. Maven Jetty debug. Oops. And that's going to run. Oops. Uh, could not find gold debug. Oh, okay. Maybe you. Um, uh, maybe oops. Ugh, this is the hard way. Okay. So what I'm going to try to do um, is run the debugger. Uh, what is it? Remote. Um, and this will be Jetty server. And uh, just copy this command line. Did I copied it. Support Maven ops equals this. Jetty run. There you go. You guys use the debugger much? Project four is when it becomes necessary to uh, to you know, it, or rather, it will help you a lot. Is it necessary? No. Will your life be better? Yes. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to set a debugger breakpoint here. I'm going to attach to that process. Okay. Now, um, I am going to go back to my browser. I'm going to list all key value pairs. Sorry, what happened there? I clicked submit, and then IntelliJ came to the foreground saying, wait, we hit a debugger breakpoint. So, uh, sorry, anyway, I guess one more thing. Don't want to tell your intelligence. Have you used a debugger before? Have you used a debugger in an IDE before? Most people? OK. So I mean, so you understand the concept. We ran, so, OK, and I went really fast. And you can go back and watch on the video. Um, I set this environment variable. I'm going to start over again. Sorry. I'm just going way too fast. OK. Um, Jetty is a Java program. I set a. Uh, an environment variable. Ah, sorry. I'm just going to start over at the beginning because I went so fast. Oops. <laughs> Oops. Nobody's great. Okay. Um, nah. Yeah. There wasn't anything there. Uh, where to go? Okay. So in IntelliJ, uh, you can edit the configurations. These are configurations for running JVMs, and you can create something called a remote, uh, a remote debugging configuration, which means that IntelliJ will uh, connect to a remote JVM. In this case, it's the JVM that runs Jetty. It's that JVM that you start with Maven by saying Maven Jetty run. Um, and there are, uh, so, so when you run the remote, when you, yeah, when you run the remote JVM, you need to put certain command lines on the JVM, sorry, command line arguments on the JVM command line that will tell the JVM, hey, please run in a mode so the debugger can connect to you. And that's what this command line argument for the running remote JVM thing is. You can click over here to copy it to the clipboard. I'm not getting a tooltip, but that's what you do. So I copied this thing. So then um, I set an environment variable called Maven Ops to the value there. And then when I invoke Maven, it will start up the Maven JVM with those, uh, with those options. And so when I say Maven Jetty run, You'll see it says listening for transport dt under bar socket at that port. Well, 
So it's basically running the JVM in a way, and it listens on a socket, socket 5005, that's what I configured it to do, for a debugger to, uh, to connect to it. Is this similar to the kind of debugging that you guys have done, as opposed to debugging core files? Right, core files are different, feel different. Okay, so this is, so you've got two processes here. Project 4 is all about multiple processes, and that's what makes it hard, right? I, I'm guessing that the vast majority of what you've done in your careers as computer scientists has already been one process all, all happening. Now you're dealing with multiple things. So very shortly we're going to see three processes. Um, a JVM that has a Jetty, um, a JVM that has a command line, and then IntelliJ, also a JVM, which, uh, which will connect to the, uh, which, which will debug, which will be a, a debugger client for the, for the Maven JVM. Okay, I've started my Jetty server. And now I want, to tell, uh, I want to tell IntelliJ to connect to that. And the way you do that is by, run, by, by running the, well, click the little debugger button with your, uh, your configuration selected. And say, great, I connected to it on this host. Awesome. I also set a debugger breakpoint by clicking over in the margin here. It says, okay, when, uh, you know, the, the JVM is executing, when it gets to this line, uh, pause the JVM and let me, uh, and drop me into the debugger. Now, it's not doing anything yet because, well, it hasn't, well, it hasn't stopped there yet because uh, that method hasn't been invoked. But that method will be invoked when I, uh, when I perform a get on this URL. Uh, so I can actually, I can just hit return here in the browser and that will hit the URL. So what have we done? I used the browser to make an HTTP request. That, that made a request off to the, uh, to the, to the Jetty server. Um, and that executed this code here, which is my code that I wrote that came from the archetype. Um, and now uh, I'm, I'm sitting here, uh, my, my, my server's in the middle of doing its thing. I've hit a debugger breakpoint, and now I can use the debugger to see what's going on. So what's going on? There's a method called do get, and that has two arguments that represent the request made by the, the client, the browser in this case, and then the response, the object, that the, the data that gets sent back to that client. Um, and so then this abstracts all the stuff HTTP does. Um, so what do I want to do? What I do is very simple because this is just the, the skeleton project. Uh, I, I do the following. First of all, I need to say, hey, listen, the kind of data that I'm going to return back to the client is text plain. So I say response dot set content response. So th these are objects that come as part of the servlet API. And then I have the business logic of my get method. So it says, okay, if the uh, if there's a parameter called key in the request, then okay, I want to get that value. And if that thing was specified, then I'm going to store the value in the uh, so we're going to write value. So write value to write the value for that key to the um, to the output to the response. Otherwise, we're going to write uh, write all the mappings to the response. So now let's use the debugger and step through this program and see what we get. Okay. So this is where I have to remember the step into, step into, step over. Okay. So I want to go to the next line, so I want to step over. So that's F8. Oh, um, IntelliJ gives you little hints about what the values of the objects are. It invokes the two strings. So like the two string of its response is like all this stuff. Great. We're HTTP. Yeah, it's, an, it's a code 200. It's a status 200, so it's all good. Oops, I can't highlight. Sorry. Um, okay. Get parameter tells me all about the request. That's cool. I'm going to step over this again. You guys know the difference between step over and step into? Okay, good. Three years ago, people didn't, so I'm glad that you guys do. Um, so I go one more line, and it's called the get parameter method. You can see what that does in a minute. Um, and it says, okay, the key that was there on, on the, the URL parameter, there was no URL parameter called key. And sure enough, there's no URL parameter called key. Okay, so key is null, so what I'm going to do, uh, sorry, well, key is Null, so that's going to that should fall through. I can go hit F8 to go over that. So I'm going to write all of the mappings to the response. Okay, that's neat. And then I'm done with my method, and I'm just going to continue on by saying, uh, is that this? No, step out. Where's continue? It's F9. I'm sorry, I don't know where the icons are. Eh, F9. Okay. That method inside the the server has now exited. And the debugger is is done, or you know, the debugger is still attached, but the breakpoint is gone. If I go back to my browser, 
I now see that the server contains zero key value pairs. Oh man, where where'd my key value pairs go? I restarted the server, right, and so that lost all the state. That's cool. Okay. So, server's got uh, no key value pairs. Uh, let's add some. Okay. Uh, you add them in a method called post. So post is a different HTTP verb which has the, the semantics of making a change. So when you post, um, you send it data. So I'm going to use the... Um, the nice forms again. HTML forms are interacting with the REST API. And I'm going to send, uh, so I'm going to, uh, I don't know, if I, view the H, if I view the page source, will that be helpful? Meh. Uh, my excellent HTML skills at work here. Um, so I have a form that posts to a, the flights URL. So posts to the flights URL. And it takes two inputs. One is called key, one is called value, and these are both passed in as parameters on the command, uh, well, parameters to the, uh, to the HTTP POST method, and I'll click submit. So something called key and something called value. Okay, so I have A and one, A is going to be the key, one is going to be the value. When I click submit, wow, where'd those buttons come from? There you go. Um, it totally looked like Netscape Navigator 3.0 for a second, anyway. Uh, okay. So I click submit, stopping the debugger again. Okay, great. Now I'm in the do post method. It has the same signature. Once again, you have a request, and you can read all about all of the API that you get from the server request and the server response. Again, I got to say, what well, I'm going to return you is plain text. Now I'm going to step through. So I'm going to say, okay, what's the key parameter? Aha, the key parameter is A. The value is A. And sure enough, that's what I passed in from the, the web form. <laughs> Good. Okay, uh, and notice that uh, I have some logic here about missing required parameters, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's fine. Luckily, you know, it doesn't trip over that. Now I'm going to get the value parameter. Value parameter is one, just like I passed in, right? Here's the one here. Goes the, the form, posts this URL, and you get a one there. Cool, and now I'm going to store the key value pair in a, in a hash map or whatever. And now I'm going to write some output. And I'm going to send it back, and I'm going to continue. So I'm done with that method. I'm going to continue on there. And uh, actually, the map to A to 1 is the thing that I wrote to the print writer that I got from the response. So, this, so what the server API does, and what you get in this do post method, what you do get in this, oh, sorry, what you get from the do get method, uh, are these these objects, these request and response objects. That, uh, that when you interact with them, that tells you, uh, that, that's where you get information about what came in on the, uh, on the URL, uh, came in the request, and then what can go back in the response. Yes? Is the SC constant, um, is that uh, sending code 200, the SC? Over that is sending code 200, right. So yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, another important thing about uh, HTTP and REST is that not only do you have like a payload that goes back, we also have a, a code that indicates uh, like, did I, you know, uh, you asked for something that I could give you. Uh, or like you asked for something I couldn't find it, 404, or like there was an internal error, like 500 or 502 and like all, all these things that you can go and read about and I talk about them in the, uh, in the lecture. Um, and part of writing a good REST API is having good error, um, error communication, uh, error propagation, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so then, yeah, you should use these uh, these codes. Yeah. Is that constant included in some library? Or yep. Is HTTP servlet response. Okay. Our friend is the same HTTP servlet response that you have up here. Okay. Do get and do post. So. Um, that's what a servlet does. It responds to, uh, to, to requests. So I've got one of those, and that runs in my server. There's a lot of the business logic for, well, a lot of the business logic for the application resides here. And like any piece of business logic, I want to be able to test it. So. Uh, I have a test for my airline servlet. Now, a servlet, so, so a servlet is like tightly coupled to this, uh, to the servlet API. And so then when I interact with it, 
Uh, oh boy, am I using Makito? <laughs> okay, so um, a servlet it expects to be run inside a web container. A web container takes some time to start up. Take, things that take time to start up are slow. You want unit tests to be fast. What do you do? Well, here's what you do. There is this, uh, this library called Makito, which uh, provides, let's just call it magic, for, um, you chuckle, but it is, um, for uh, taking a, an object and making what are called mock objects. So it's something that uh, conforms to the interface or, provide, or, or it provides like the same methods and everything like that. But Makito allows you to specify what particular behavior you want from that mock object. And so um, I, I don't want to hit the time because my gosh, it's already nine o'clock. Um, to I'm not going to go time to go into this in detail, and maybe we can do it next time, or maybe we can just you know, talk about it during the uh, dur during the week. But if you want, you can write unit tests that execute really fast um, for for your servlet, and I recommend that you do um, because the, the the functionality of your servlet it can get kind of complex. And so then, oh, um, I want wait, I want us yes. It's telling me that because I'm in the debugger. I want to turn off the debugger. Oh, it worked, by the way. Um, where's the debugger? There we go. I'm going to detach from the debugger. Detach from the process. And I'm going to run this, these tests again. So this test allows me to interact with my, uh, with my servlet, even though it's not running inside a container. Um, and this is actually pretty big. So this will let you uh, implement uh, unit tests for your servlet. Fun thing for you to figure out on your own. Oops. No, oh, sorry. Okay. What do I got up here? Let's talk about. Okay, so that's the server side. So as we saw, we hit the server with, from the web browser. It was doing stuff. We stopped in the debugger. We were able to like look at the API, look at the Java objects that are involved. Let's talk about what happens on the client side. So the client side is a command line application. Great, you know all about those, right? So you know how to parse the command line. You know how to like validate all that string input. You've been doing this for three weeks now. You're experts. So the new part is interacting with the with the REST API. Is invoking the uh, invoking the server, making those calls to the server, basically doing what the browser does, right? Making these HTTP requests. Um, and so the way you do this is they have there are libraries that are part of the, the, the JDK that know how to you know open up the right socket connection and talk HTTP and there are uh, there's like um, and we learned yeah, and there's all, this is all covered in the lectures there's um, uh, classes like Java Util URL sorry Java Net U URL which represents a URL so the same thing that you have here in the you know in the browser one of these guys you can create a Java object and you can interact you can interact with that by, and by interacting with that Java object you interact with that URL so you can you know get a post and you can do a post and you can do a get um, the APIs that come standard with Java are pretty low level um, and uh, they work but I don't really want you to spend so much time focusing on it so I've written some abstractions on top of that inside uh, this rest uh, the airline rest client so this is, you get this from the, the archetype, this is a Java class that allows you to interact with the, uh, uh, with the, with the web server um, and hides a bunch of the ugly, but not all, a bunch of the ugly um, HTTP stuff that happens underneath the covers. So this is a Java object, so Java code is going to call this. So you create one of these guys and you say, hey, here's the host and here's the port. And what it does is it creates, you know, a, here's the URL. That you uh, that that you hit, and so this is client side. So here again, you've got one code base, but the code some of the code is run on the server side, some of the code is run on the client side. There might even be code that is run on both sides, but anyway, um, you'll find that out. So this is what the command line program uses to interact with the uh, with the with a web server. So it's got methods like get me all the keys and values. So how does it get all the keys and values? Well, this is on the client side. That hash map, that, that map of keys and values doesn't reside on the client side. That's over on the web server. How do you get from the web server? You make an HTTP request. 
And so what do you do? You use the get method and say, hey, get me that URL. That will return a response. Uh, this response object is uh, part of a API class that I wrote that handles all of the communication with the server. Um, and so I guess we can go look at that. So this is one of my classes. It's often one of my packages. And it tells you things like, hey, here's the response code that came back from the uh, URL request. Here is the content, so the big all the text that came over, how many lines the content has, because that might be interesting. It also um, does some error handling for you, which is nice. So you've got this REST client uh, code that will uh, go and do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So basically what you do is you say, get me that URL, and great, it returns you uh, an object that lets you say, here's what the return code was, and also just give me the text that was written to the, the HTTP result. So this is Java code. And because it's Java code, you want to write a test for it. Now, you could write a unit test for this. Um, but remember, the unit test runs in isolation. And just like with the servlet test where you had to mock out all the stuff provided by the web container, here you have to mock out the entire web service itself. And that's probably not very useful. However, uh, I still want to test this code. And I want to test, so, so I have to test this code with a real web server. So this means I need an integration test. Right? Remember what integration tests are, the difference between integration tests and unit tests? Unit tests are meant to be very lightweight and run in the matter of milliseconds because you're just testing like one unit of work, just a class. There's going to be a couple methods in that class. Integration tests, though, are expected to take longer. And so uh, one of the reasons they're expected to take longer is that, yep, they're testing the interaction between multiple things. But it's also uh, possible that one of those things they test interaction with is something heavy and expensive to start, like a web server or a database. So I have integration tests that, as part of the setup for the integration tests, it starts up Jetty and will deploy, your, uh, d deploy the, the web application, deploy the servlet into Jetty, and then it'll run the tests. And here, you can run the test against the uh, uh, against that Jetty server. So now what I'm going to do is oh I'm already I'm already running on port 8080 here. So now I'm going to run these integration tests and the integration tests uh, do the following. Um, like the first thing it does is it clears out everything from the, the from the server and then it does some simple tests like okay you know hey an empty server should contain no mappings and so now I'm interacting uh, with with the rest client I have a little helper method here oops I will help a little method here that um, uh, will create an uh, airline rest client with the on local host with the uh, given configured port and then I'll call the methods so this is Java code that's running as part of an integration test that will then interact with my web server. So um, I'll just go ahead and run it and let's see what happens. Hey, four things ran in a kind of funny order, but uh, everything passed. And let's see here, it does stuff like, oh, adds one key value pair. Here's the key, here's the value. Okay, well, now let's go back here and uh, well, let's reload this URL. We'll do a get of the URL. Oh, and there it is. There's the test information. So I ran these tests. Uh, I ran a test in IntelliJ against my Jetty server that's running here. Uh, and that was that. Now, let's say one of my tests fails. Uh, it's actually super convenient that I can run an IntelliJ. That's nice. Let's say one of my tests fails and I want to understand why. I want to be able to debug this test. Instead of running IntelliJ, I, I can. So uh, let's say... Um, Let's say this test was failing, so I want to set a debugger point here. And so now I'll run my uh, test again. Aha, good, I'm stopped here in the debugger. Um, and uh, now I can you know, do all the debugger stuff. I can look at value and I can, I, I can play with stuff here. So this is debugging uh, the, the, the unit test. Okay, that's pretty cool. But what happens if I'm surprised by what the server is returning me? What do I do then? Well, I want to debug the server. Okay. I'll go back to my Jetty server. I'll attach the debugger to it. I will, uh, then I will go, let's see here. Yeah, then I will go and I will run my 
integration test again, and I want to debug that also. Ah, I hit a debugger breakpoint, and here I am in, this is on the server side, right? This is the do get. Great, now I can go through and I can debug all this good stuff. Oh, I hit another deb debugger breakpoint, okay. Uh, and this is the server again. And this is the do post, okay, that's cool. I'm gonna do get, oh, another debugger, uh, debugger breakpoint. This is on the client side. I'm debugging two different processes. This gets confusing, right? Because remember, one project in IntelliJ is working with two processes. In this case, one, pro well, the process, one process is the Jetty server, and so I've attached to that guy and debugging over there, and the other one is this unit test that I'm debugging. Uh, over, sorry, this integration test that I'm debugging here. But you can do it! That's the cool thing. Right? It's a little confusing. You gotta sort of remember, you know, which side of the divide that you're on, but you can do it. And you'll probably need to do it as part of implementing your project four. Um, but this is, you know, this is the client server world. You're dealing with multiple processes. Yes? Um, when you attach the debugger to the Eddy server and mm -hmm. hit the debug button, does it reinstance the server? Nope. Or does it it just go. It, it, yeah, I mean, so the the VM is just sitting there waiting for someone to talk to it on po on port uh, five zero zero five. Yep. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the process itself never goes away. Okay. Well, hey, that's all very neat. So now, okay, yeah, I'm done. I'm done here. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay I'm gonna I'm gonna stop debugging stuff right here. Looks like that's already done. Everybody's happy. Okay. Well, that's nice. Um. So this is so. So I just talked about this airline REST client. So this provides a nice Java API over the uh, over the over the REST communication over the HTTP uh, and on all of that. Okay, that's nice because I want a nice Java API for my project four. Project four is my command line, and I don't want to be making like HTTP calls and stuff here. I want to abstract all of that over the REST client. Cool. And so what does this guy need to do? Oh, this is this is easy. He just uh, parses the command line, and then you know I got my host name, got my port, do all the nice checking and stuff. I create an airline REST client, and I uh, and I do stuff. Um, and so then I check, hey, if the key that was passed in the command line is null, then I want to print all the key value pairs. So I call get all key value pairs on my clients, and then I write it. So I I, I do that. And then, so what that method does, that will go and call the, the REST API, make the HTTP call, get the results back, return it in, um, uh, take that response object, convert it into a map of string, uh, string key values. This map is just like your airline, right? Okay. Um, yep. And, uh, and then uh, I want to write it to standard out, which, is, uh, which ultimately is what that message goes to. Yeah, message is printed to uh, standard out there. I, I tried to embody some important design principles. Things like um, having all of the code that, uh, that interacts with the REST service all hidden, not hidden, all encapsulated, there you go, all encapsulated inside that REST client class. Um, the REST client um, doesn't expose the, uh, doesn't expose there you go. It doesn't expose things like the response object. It doesn't uh, It doesn't expose the um, HTTP error code. Instead, what it does is it throws an exception um, if uh, there's a problem with the HTTP request. So, uh, and, and and this is nice because uh, you don't want you want keep you want to have a separation of responsibilities. You don't want your main method to have to know about the HTTP call. Right, that's that's too much. That's sort of a burden on the main method, uh, and so you encapsulate all that inside the REST client. So you've got this REST client that deals with 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 the API, and you can write an integration test for that. Super awesome. Uh, you know what I also want to do? I want to write an integration test for my command line, um, so I can make sure that the command line uh, is doing the right thing, and I can do that. I've got a project four integration test which essentially I think does the same thing as the uh, airline REST client integration test, but uses the command line tool to do it. Um, yeah, it kind of cheats by creating its own uh, REST client because the command line doesn't actually, the command line tool doesn't support removing all the mapping, so I have to use the API for that. But the rest of them are just our good old friend invoke main. So now I'm going to uh, run this test. 
And good. All that stuff works by going by using the the command line. So now I can test all parts of my program. I can test my uh, I can test my servlet um, using that Makito stuff, which is magic. And so you know, uh, I, I encourage you to uh, go figure that out. Um, but I can also test in the, I also have these integration tests which run inside uh, which are, which require the the web server to be running and will uh, will leverage it. So I want so just because you're writing a web application doesn't mean you can't use test driven development. And just because you're writing a web application doesn't mean you can't use the tools that you're used to like JUnit and the the integration tests and you know, testing your command line. So the uh, so so you've got all you've got a web application you've got uh, um, uh, you've got unit tests you've got integration tests uh, and not only can all this be run from IntelliJ uh, but I've got the Maven project uh, configured such that uh, when you run Maven verify it'll do the normal stuff that it usually does it will you know co compile the code it will run the unit tests but it also goes. And dur during the integration test phase, it'll start up a Jetty there. So Maven starts up Jetty. It will deploy your servlet to that uh, to that Jetty. Deploy your web application to that to, to that Jetty. Run the integration tests and report the output. So you've got all the tooling that you're used to, right? So even though here again, even though you're doing a web application, which is a big leap beyond what you're doing in Project Three, you can still use all the tools that you've come to rely on when it comes to building reliable code. All of your unit testing, all of your integration testing. Excited? Scared? Tired? I know I am. Okay. Any questions on that? I know it's a lot, and so you know we got it all recorded, and I encourage you to go through and watch it again. Um, this is due in two weeks. <laughs> Things are piling up. You still got the code and stuff to finish off. So um, have fun with your pretty printers, and then move on to this. Is that it? Okay, great. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for participating in the experiment with the code katas. Um, next week, uh, we'll probably use more pair programming, but not like in front of everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.